Good morning. I've got to tell you, go ahead and open your Bible to Luke 3, going right from verses 2 to 6. Uh, technically, it's 1 to 6. There are a lot of hard names in verse 1, so we're going to skip it and, and go to verse 2. Uh, it, it is hard for me to realize it's Christmas time again. Uh, it seems like we just did that uh, not long ago. And in connection, I've done an announcement to make about Christmas. Uh, Jimmy has been informed of this, and his wife's not going to be happy with me. That's a ball. Um, the office is closed from December 17th through 31st, so there's not going to be a newsletter or hand out anything like that. Hey, hey, let me tell you, I've never seen anybody work as hard as today. I, I got to tell you, she needs a break. And so I told her, she's taking a break now. And I just want to make it known publicly that she's taking a break now. And uh, in Luke 3, 1 to 6, I, I had the privilege and honor of preaching in a whole lot of places. I preached, I think, if, if memory serves, and I'm counting correctly, I looked at a map of the United States, and I think I'm right. I preached in 18 states, and probably close to, if not more than, 50 different congregations. And every congregation is different. I have preached in predominantly African American churches. I preached in predominantly white churches. One church I preached that day. You're not going to be able to guess where it was, what state, but it was largely Native Americans. And uh, that was an experience. I preached in rich churches, poor churches, big churches, small churches, all sorts of different people and places and churches. And I was privileged years ago to go to the Eastern European country of Albania on a mission trip, and I preached there. But I had to have an interpreter, because I, I couldn't speak Albanian, so I, I had an interpreter. And I began my sermon by saying that when I was a kid, my brothers and I fought like cats and dogs. That's a common English idiom. They don't use that in Albania. The translator just stopped mid-sentence and stared at me. He didn't know how to interpret that, didn't know what I had said or understand it. And so off the cuff, I, I don't know what I did, but I had changed directions with that introduction. But do you know why I've gone several places to preach? It's because God wants everyone to hear His Word. God wants those folks in Albania to hear His Word. God wants those Native Americans to whom I preach to hear the Word. The African Americans, the whites, everybody else in between. In every land, every country, God wants everyone to hear His Word. That's what Jesus Himself said. The Lord said in Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all nations. How are you going to make disciples of all nations if you don't take the word of God to everybody? The Lord also said, Luke 24, 47, repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in my name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem. To all nations, everybody, because God wants everybody to hear His word. Acts 1 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. God wants everybody. To hear his word. 
I know you believe that too. And that's why some of you men have filled the pulpit from time to time. That's why several of you teach Bible class. That's why some of you have been on foreign mission trips. Why some of you work with World Bible School. Why some of you, most of you, spent good time inviting friends and family to bring a free day. Because you understand that God wants everyone, everyone, to hear His Word. And that is the main message we find in Luke 3, 1 to 6. Beginning at verse 2, Luke records, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, Annas was a real high priest, Caiaphas was his son-in-law, uh, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, God's been silent for 400 years. Been no prophets. But John is a prophet. Luke makes that clear. The word of God came to him. Not John's ideas. Not what John thinks or what John wants. The word of God came to John. What he was going to proclaim was the Word of God. And this is not just any old John. The Word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah. I don't believe any word of Scripture is wasted. Son of Zechariah means something. You know what it means? You remember in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel came to Zechariah when Zechariah was in the temple and said, you're going to have a son and name him John. He's going to be Jesus' forerunner. And what Luke says here, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah. He's pointing out that God keeps his promises. God said to Zechariah, you're going to have a son who's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And Luke records, that's exactly what happened. The word of God came to John, not just any John, but the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. You remember, for 40 years, it's been mentioned already this morning, for 40 years the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. It's likely a literary device here that Luke mentions the wilderness to point out that just as God led his people from Egypt to the promised land through the wilderness, God now is going to bring people from the darkness of sin, the slavery of sin, in the wilderness to the light of his word. And verse 3, he went to all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins that he has been saved. You understand that baptism was well understood in the days of John. Any Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism, become a proselyte, had to submit to baptism because it was a symbolic way that they washed away the filth and stink pollution of being a Gentile. But John does something different. He told the Jews, it's not just about washing away the filth of being a Gentile. Even you Jews who think that you're right with God just because you're sins of Abraham. You need to be immersed and wash away the filth of sin and repent of sin. Verse 4. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, as it is written. That's an important word in Greek. It's one word. 
It is in the perfect tense. You've heard me talk about the perfect before. The perfect refers to something that happened in the past, but the effects are still felt in the present. What the Greek really means here is it stands written in Scripture. It stands written. It is written. No changing it. No defiling it. No thinking maybe this is different. It stands written. It is written. It has been written in the past. And that truth still applies today. That's the meaning. The book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. and Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. There's a bunch to unpack in that quotation from Isaiah 40. First, think about this for a second, folks. The omnipotent great God, creator of the universe, had to have his way prepared. Think about that for a second. Jesus Christ, your creator, everything was made through him, John 1. Without him, nothing was made that was made. He could not just come and powerfully make his own way. He had ever prepared. Do you know why? Because God has placed his treasure in earthen vessels. Remember when the Ethiopian eunuch was on his way back from Jerusalem? An angel came and told Philip, go join yourself to the chariot and teach the man. Why didn't the angel go and do it? He could have just shown up there in the chariot and go. It's not the way it works. God gave man both that responsibility and that privilege of sharing the word. And so God had to have a mortal man come and prepare his way. Notice how he was going to prepare the way of the Lord. He was going to make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. John's a road engineer in this prophecy, in this poetic way. And what he's doing is coming along and making the road perfectly straight and level. He's filling in every valley. He's lowering every hill. And that way is just going to be straight and wide. And Jesus is going to have no trouble walking it. He's not going to have to climb a hill. He's not going to have to go down the valley. It's going to be easy sailing. The idea is that John was going to make things easier for Jesus. He was going to get that soil ready for Jesus to come and claim his word. Make it easy for him. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. There is where we're going to zero in this morning. The idea that God wants everyone to hear his word. That's where I got that point for this morning. All Flesh, all flesh, shall see the salvation of God. The other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark, quote from Isaiah 40 in relation to John the Baptizer and show that he's the forerunner of Jesus. He's come to make his path straight. But Luke alone quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 5. 
all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Luke was very concerned with showing that everybody, everybody could come to Jesus. That in his gospel, he shows that everybody can come to Jesus. He talks about foreigners and so forth in his gospel. And in the book of Acts, the word spreads everywhere. Luke shows in his two-volume work that everybody can come to Jesus. The word can spread to everybody. And that God wants everyone, everyone, everyone to hear his word. All, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Therefore, we can say with confidence that God wants everyone to hear His Word. Well, how does that change day-to-day life? What's it mean on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday that God wants everyone to hear His Word? What do we do practically because God wants everyone to hear His word? There's one thing I want you to leave here this morning and understand. God wants you to hear His word. God wants all flesh to see the salvation of God. You are flesh. Therefore, God wants you individually to see his salvation, to know his word, to understand his word, to know it. God wants everyone to hear his word. God wants you to hear it. So how do you go about hearing the word? Well, first, you need to hear the word. You need to hear the Word. The Word of God is so very important and vital. You see, that Word leads you to life. 1 Peter 1.23 You have been born again, born again, a new life through the living and abiding Word of God. That Word of God brings new life, allows you to be born again. That Word leads you away from sin and temptation. Psalm 119.11 I stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the Word brings hope. Romans 15.4 Through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Do you need hope in your life? You need encouragement. You need to know that in the end, everything is going to work out just right. Maybe not here and now. I grant you that. You, you, you know that. But in the end, everything is made perfect. Do you want that hope? Go to Scripture. That's where that hope is found. God gives us hope through Scripture. Brothers and sisters, let me be honest. Let me just get real. We need to do a better job with our Bible classes. It is important that we attend Bible classes. You see, the church has always read publicly the scriptures. Justin Martyr, 
about AD 155, wrote of the early Christian assembly, the memoirs, the apostles, or the prophets are read as long as time permits. He talks about the church coming together and the Lord's Supper and, and different elements of worship. And he says the memoirs of the apostles, the, the gospels, and the prophets, probably the epistles, Old Testament, Scripture, read as long as time permits. Church would come together and hear the word. Do you know why the church in A.D. 155, thereabouts, in the days of Justin, came together to hear Scripture? Because the church from the very beginning came together to hear Scripture. Colossians 4.16 And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of Laodiceans, Paul says, when you get finished with this letter I've written, send it to Laodicea so the church there can hear that word of law and can understand the gospel and can read it. And also, Revelation 1.3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear church would come together. Revelation to John would be read, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who have come together and who hear it. You need to make a commitment to be in Bible study. You need to make a commitment to be with the church Wednesday, Sunday morning, to hear the Word of God. You know, look, we don't come together to whistle Dixie Crown, folks. We come together to hear the Word of life, the Word of God. And if you know something more important than doing that, I would really like to know what it is. Dealing with the Word of life, the Word of God. And let me suggest something else. Inconvenience yourself for the Word of God. To inconvenience yourself, go out of your way to hear the Word of God. I, I, I can't help but think of when Ezra read the law to the exiles, returning exiles after the Babylonian captivity. Nehemiah 8, 1 to 8. Men, women, and all those who could understand, the children who could understand, listened to the law from early morning until midday. From early morning to midday, Six, seven hours, perhaps? They listened to the law. Preacher goes more than 30 minutes, people get upset. And, and here are folks who listen to the law of God, the Word of God, for hours on end. And you know what else they did? Verse 5 of Nehemiah 8, the assembly stood when Ezra opened the book of the law, these folks, these ancestors of us spiritually, stood, stood for hours to hear the word of God. Can you imagine how tiring that had to be? To stand there and to hear the word. But the word is that important. And, and they show reverence by standing. You, you know, if you watch on TV when the president walks in the room, people stand. That, that's what you do, a sign of respect for that altar. Standing to hear scripture. 
sign of respect for that word. People listen for hours. Hear that word. Here's how you can apply that. Think, think, think with me about going out of your way to hear the word. Maybe I, I, you have a job where you can leave a little early on Wednesday to come and be ready for Bible study. I, I know that's not possible for everybody, so don't. But maybe that's an option for you. Maybe an option is you give up a hobby for a day or two this week. Spend that time in the Word. Maybe the option is that when you're tired on Wednesday and want to just go home and prop your feet up, you come to Bible class instead. Maybe you turn off your favorite TV show. You spend time in the Word. Go out of your way. Do something a little inconvenient instead of the word. You see what you're saying to yourself and to God and to others is this is the most important thing in the world. This is what leads me to heaven. This is what shows me who Jesus is. This is what shows me who God is. It's that important, brothers and sisters. It's the word of life. You know, I love to read Stephen King. I, not sure what a psychologist might say about that, but, but I love to read him. Has a new book, I'm going to buy it on my Kindle and I'm going to sit there and read it. There's no substitute for the Word of God. You know, I love to read, Tammy loves to read, Our boys love to read. But there's nothing better to read than the Word. You get into the Word to understand the Word, to be shaped and formed in the image of Jesus through that Word. You need to hear the Word of God. But two, and I thought I had changed that one, but two, you need to heed the Word. You need to heed the Word. In other words, you need to obey the Word of God. You see, if you examine the context of Luke 3, the entire context, you find that people are obeying the Word of God. John comes on the scene proclaiming the Word of God. And what's he proclaim? Repent for a, a bad... He began, I'm confusing Acts 2 and Luke 3. He began to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You know what you find people doing in Luke 3? Being baptized for the remission of sins after they've repented. Exactly what that preaching was. We need to follow that example. We need to follow the example of those Jews there at the Jordan. To hear the word as they did. And then to obey the word as they did. You know, I, I'm afraid many times when Scripture is read, people think, you know, that Scripture sure does apply to so-and-so. Boy, I wish so-and-so were here to hear that sermon this morning. Well, he or she really messed up and needs to hear the word. Well, the truth of the matter is we need to look inside. We need to take that word, the word of light, the word of God, and look at it for us. What's God saying to you? What does God say you need to change in your life? I know there are areas you need to change in your life. I'll just be honest with you. I don't know what those are, but I had those areas. You had those areas. We need to become more and more like Jesus. That's what Scripture does. And as we spend time in the Word, we need to heed the Word. Do what it says. Look, you know the importance of obeying the Word of God. Matthew 7.21 
Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I'm always baffled by these religious folks, Christians, who say that obedience really isn't that important. I, I've had folks tell me that. You know, uh, uh, you, obedience is, is kind of optional. It's not that important. Well, if you want to go to heaven, it is, at least according to the Lord Jesus. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven the one who obeys, that's the one who enters heaven. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to see the glories that God has prepared from the foundation of the world, you've got to obey the Word of God. There is no other way. The one who does the will of the Father in heaven is the one who will enter his kingdom. But are you really obeying the word? Are there parts of your life that you kind of keep hidden from the world? From the word that you really don't want the word to penetrate because you want to hold on to this or to that or the other thing it's time to give them up to look in scripture to see the word of God and do the word of God as you read scripture this week Maybe you need to circle some verses. Write some verses down or whatever. Works for you. To impact your life. Talk about the struggles you have. The sin that you deal with. That you can highlight what needs to change in your life. And as you look at Scripture and see what needs to be changed, pray about it. Ask God to give you the strength to endure. Ask God for the strength to do what is right. You know, Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness after the Lord had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. After he had spent time with God. And he was strong to resist the devil. If you want to resist the devil, spend time in prayer. Ask God to give you the strength. Let me encourage you to repent of your sin. As you look at Scripture, and you see where you have sinned, repent of it. Turn away from it. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Maybe you need to go to a stronger brother or sister. Maybe to the elders. If I can help you, I'd be happy to. Maybe you need to go to someone and say, help me. Help me deal with this sin and to put it away. But let me encourage you to do something not only. Tonight, tonight, before you put your head on your pillow and you go to sleep, have a plan in place to deal with a sin in your life. What are you going to do? Are you going to meditate on the Word of God? Are you going to pray for strength? Do you need to go to someone and ask for help? Have you a plan in place to put that sin away from you? So that you can heed that word of God that God wants everybody to hear. So that your life can be molded by 
what is right and not by the lies that Satan comes and tells. Well, that crowd to whom John spoke obeyed the word. They repented. They were baptized. Just like he preached. But you know, there are some hard-hearted folk in that crowd. There are some Sadducees and Pharisees who came to torment him, to test him. Big surprise there, right? But their hearts were hard and they, they, they didn't obey. Where is your heart this morning? Do you need to repent of sin? Do you need to be baptized to have those sins forgiven? If there is any way that we can help you live according to Scripture, won't you let us know that right now as we stand and sing?